Welcome back, boys and girls, to another lesson in Algebra 1. This is Mr. Bean, and today we will be talking about the greatest common factor. And this is the first lesson in our unit on factoring. Extremely, extremely important stuff for us to be used throughout Algebra 2. Pre-calculus, even in calculus, we're going to use this stuff over and over again. So this is a great place to start with an easier lesson. I think you'll enjoy this 9-1 because it really is one of the easier lessons of the year. But let's get some of these basics down. Factoring. Factoring, we can kind of, a factor is both a verb and a noun. A verb because it's an action thing. For example, it's the same thing as unmultiplying. Unmultiplying. Un Apply, however you spell that word. So that's why it's a verb, because we're instead of multiplying something, we're unmultiplying or undistributing. You'll see what I mean here in a minute. It's also a noun, because you can call what are the factors of something. For example, if we take the number 12, number the number 12 is the same thing as saying 3 times 4. Or you could also say that it 12 is the same thing as 1 times 12. You know, there's several different factors. 3 is a factor of 12 because it goes in evenly. 4 is also a factor of 12 because it goes in evenly, divides in evenly to the number 12. So they're both verbs and nouns, so just kind of don't be confused when we're talking about factors, factoring. It's both verbs and nouns. So then we're going to talk about what is the greatest common factor. Well, we have this GCF for short. We're going to refer to that GCF quite a bit. Let's move that kind of out of the way because I'm going to write some things here. So what are the factors of 12 and 8? I'll move this out of the way so you have more room to see this. 12 and 8, the greatest common factor. Now that means the greatest common factor is the greatest number, the largest number that can go into both of these. So what I do is I like to just start with this number 12 and say, okay, can 12 go into 18? No. So what's another number? Can 10 go into both? No. What's the largest number that can go into 12? Uh, 6. 6 goes into 12. Can 6 also go into 18? Yes, it does. So 6 is the greatest common factor of both of these two numbers. 7 and 21. What's the greatest common factor here? Well, let's see here. Uh, the only thing that goes into 7 is both the number 7 and 1. And then 21, yeah, there we go. So 7 can go into both 7 and 21. So 5 and 16 through a little tricky one. This one does not have a greatest common factor, so we would just say it's the number 1. You can't really, the 1 is the only thing that divides evenly into both of these things. So that's the GCF. So that's just a quick review from our middle school, maybe late elementary age uh, math to remind us how we do the greatest common factor. So now let's put it to use with algebra. But I want to remind you, this isn't in your notes, I just wanted to remind you real quick how you distribute. So if we take this number 3 and distribute to both of these things, you'd end up with 6x plus 15. That is distributing. Today's lesson, what we're going to do is practice how do you take this 6x plus 15 and go backwards this direction? How can you make it back to find the factors? That's what we're going to work on. So here we go. First one, let's factor out a number first. So this first one factoring out a number, what I like to do is, to help you visualize what we're doing, we're going to divide both of these things by the largest possible number. So let's see here. The largest number that can go into both 6 and 9 is the number 3. So I'm going to divide by 3. So I make a little fraction. And then I write 3 times, because 3 is what I divided out. So again, this is kind of like we are undistributing undistributing. That's supposed to be an arrow there. Sorry. So we're undistributing it, and therefore we get 6 divided by 3 is 2. So we have the 2x there. 9 divided by 3, so plus 3. And there we go. And our, that's our answer, and we can always check to see if our answer is right, because if you just real quick in your head, you take this 3 and distribute, distribute, you'd end up with 6x plus 9. So you can double check yourself to see if it was right. All right, now, Let's go to this one, factor out a variable. So for this first one, let's see, I am going to again divide underneath here by some things. So I, there's no number that I'm going to be dividing out. We're just looking at the variable. They both have an x. So I'm going to divide an x out to the front with parentheses. So the x is now on the outside. Now what's left here? This little fraction is going to simplify to 3x. 
minus, and then 5x divided by x, it's like those x's cancel, and I'm just left with 5. So there's my answer. And what can you do to double check to see if you're right? You could take this x and just distribute. Distribute to the 3x, distribute to the minus 5x, and if you end up with what you started with, then you did it right. All right, next one. Now we're go not going to just take out a number or a variable, we're doing both of them. So sometimes, so the GCF here is going to be both a number and a variable. What goes into both the number 8 and the number 10? Both the number 8 and number 10. So let's see here. 8 goes into 8, but it can't go into 10. Let's take half of 8. 4. 4 goes into 8, but it doesn't go into 10. Okay, how about half of that? 2. I think that's it. The number 2 can go into both. And then we look at the variables. They both have an n, so let's go ahead and divide out an n. So we're factoring out or unmultiplying. So we end up with 2n parentheses, because that's here, the 2n is what I'm taking out. Then I'm left with 4n. Now, how did I get that? Because 8 divided by 2 is 4. The n squared divided by the n, you see this here, n squared divided by n, leaves you with only 1n left. Now we go plus, and then the next term, 10 divided by 2 is 5. And then these n's completely cancel, so there's no n left here. And there we go. Now let's see, how do you check to see if you did it right? How do you check to see if you did this right? You take the 2n and distribute, distribute. So 2n times 4n is 8n squared. Yes, nice. And then the 2n times 5 is a 10n. Perfect, it worked out. Okay, so let's do some more. Uh, we come down here. And now we're looking for, look at all three of these terms here. All three terms, a lot of students, what they'll do when they start off doing this incorrectly is they see an x squared and they think, okay, let's take out an x. But every single term has to have an x. This one has an x, so you'd be okay there. This term does not have an x. You cannot divide out an x to everything. So whatever you put underneath these fractions has to be the same thing. So I'm thinking that a 3 probably goes into all of them, and that's it. There's no other x. Yep, because so, we're just factoring out a number. So then I'm going to write the 3 on the outside of the parentheses, and then you just take these little fractions and simplify them. So we get x squared plus 7x minus a 10, and then that's it. And again, you check your answer by taking that 3 and distributing it, multiplying it out, and then you'll see that you have the same thing. All right, next one. So let's just, we're working on just a variable because it's, that's the subject that it's under. So let's make our little fraction. I always like to check and double check the numbers though. Three can be divided out. Three can be divided out of that, but three does not go into 20. So, yep, it's just the variable. Okay, look at these. We have a p to the fourth, a p cubed, and a p squared. What that really means is that there is one, two, three, four p's. And here there are one, two, three p's. And here there are one, two p's. That's what this means. So what is the most number of little p values here that we can divide out? Two of them. You can't, you can take four out of this one, but you can't take four out of these two. You can take three out of the first two, but you can't take three from this one because it only has two. So the most you can take out is a p squared, p squared, p squared. Okay, so if that's what I'm dividing by, I'm going to put a p squared in front of my parentheses. And now you just take each of these little fractions and simplify them. So I'm left with 3. p to the, ooh, what's that? If I have 4 p's and I divide two of them away, I'm now left with 2. So it's p squared. Plus, the number stays the same as 15. And then if I had 3 p's and divided two of them out, so two of those things are going to cancel, and it leaves me with just 1 p left. And then here... The p squared is canceling with both these p squared, so all I have left is the minus 20. Minus 20. And then, I love it because then checking your answer is so easy with these problems. You can just check yourself to see if you're right. Distribute the p squared to all of them, and you should end up with the original problem you started with. Okay, and then the last one on the, for this part of the notes is taking out again. We're going to divide both out. So let's make our little fraction here. What am I going to divide by? So what goes into both 12 and 30? Ooh, so can 12 go into both? Nope, 12 does not go into 30. How about the number 6? I think that's it. 6 can go into 12. 6 also goes into 30. And then let's check the t's. So here I have 3 t's. Here I have 2 t's. So the most I can divide out is 2. 
So I'm going to put a two uh, t squared, so t to the second power. So that's what I'm putting in front of my parentheses. And let's simplify this thing. 12 divided by 6 is 2. t cubed divided by t squared is two of them cancel, so I'm left with just one t. And then plus, what is, do I have here? 30 divided by 6 is a 5. And then I have a t squared divided by t squared makes that whole thing cancel. So all I have left there is the 5. Okay, whoo. So in the practice section, you won't have it labeled like this where it's just a number, just a variable, or factor on both. You kind of have to figure out what are you supposed to do with these each particular problem. Now we're on to the zero product property. Zero product property, incredibly important. I want you to underline, underline, underline the word zero because this only works when an equation equals zero. It can't equal anything else. So you get to use the zero product property only when it equals zero. It seems pretty self-explanatory. You'll be amazed how many times we're going to correct our students this year and reminding them, oh, it's got to equal zero. So here's the way that it is. Write down that a times b equals zero. Well, if this is true, if a times b equals zero, and I don't know what a is, I don't know what b is, I'm just making something up, then that means a has to equal zero or b has to equal zero. One of these two things has to be true. The only way possible for a and b to equal zero is if the a is a zero or the b is a zero. Okay, that's the only way you can multiply two things to get a zero. Pretty easy. I mean, it's really, it's something you've been learning, you've already known since you first started multiplying. Anything times zero is zero. The reason that's important is for these problems down here. So here, let's do this. I have two factors here. I have a two and I have a three x plus one. So with those two factors, I'm going to say that this is kind of like my A and this is like my B. So what I'm trying to do is take the either A has to equal zero or B equals zero. So I like Mr. Brust, what he does here. Excuse me, I just said I like Mr. Brust. That was crazy. I mean, I like how Mr. Brust teaches this. And that is he draws this line in between the A and the B, in between your, your terms. It's kind of cool because then you can say this. You can say, all right, well, then that means that two has to equal zero or... 3x plus 1 has to equal 0. And then you just solve these two, two things. I'll come back to this one because that one's kind of weird. Let's do this one first. So subtract 1, and you get 3x equals negative 1. Divide both sides by 3, and you get x equals the fraction negative 1 third. All right, so there's one of my answers right there. Now what about this other one? Well, if you ever have, this is kind of weird, if you ever have two, a number equaling zero, that's not possible, right? Two doesn't equal zero, so you're just kind of done there. You ignore that one, and this is your only answer when you just have a number, okay? So there's the first one. So now let's use zero product property here. So we've already factored these. I'm giving them to you factored. So you have this first part is A, and the second part is B. So here's my A term, my A and my B, and I want each of those to equal zero. So I'm going to draw this imaginary line right here that splits up the factors. And then we can write out that this factor, 2x, has to equal 0. Or we take this one, which is 3x plus 1 has to equal 0. We already solved that one, right, that over here, 3x plus 1. So we can just jump to the answer there. x equals negative 1 third. But then over here, 2x equals 0. Now notice the difference. This time, there is an x here. Over here, there was no x, so we just ignored it. But when we have an x, we still have to, to solve it. So let's divide both sides by 2, and you get x equals 0. So this problem has two answers, x equals 0 or x equals negative 1 third. In fact, if you want, you could even write it like this. You could just say x equals 0 comma negative one third. That's just saying that x equals both of those. x equals zero and x equals negative one third. All right, this one here. So now we have three factors. Holy cow. So we've, it's not just an a and a b. It's like an a, a b, and a c. So all we do now is let's divide this up into our three different areas and set up our little equations. So we have the first term is a 4x, the first uh, expression there. So 4x has to equal zero or x minus 4 4 has to equal 0. Oh, man, I got to write pretty small there. Sorry. And then this last one, this last factor is 2x plus 5 would have to equal 0. So one of these three things, we solve them all. So we get x equals 0 there. That's easy. 
add the 4, you get x equals 4. And then this last one, subtract the 5. So 2x equals negative 5. And then divide both sides by 2. So x equals negative 5 halves. So our answers are x equals 0, 4, and negative 5 halves. So that's really nice when it's already factored for you like these problems are here. Okay, so our last little bit is now we're doing everything in this whole lesson all in one step. So we're going to solve by factoring. Remember, when you see this word solve, we're trying to figure out what x equals. So we're going to solve this by first factoring. So it, we're going to factor here. What in the world can I factor out of this thing? Let's see. What comes out of 5x squared? I think a 5x can go into both. Yes, that's right. 5x goes into both. So that's what I'm going to pull out to the side here. 5x times. Now what's left here? 5 cancels. x squared divided by x is just an x. Minus. Here, the 10 divided by 5 is a 2. The x is also canceled. So all I have left is 5x times x minus 2. Don't forget my equals 0. Equals 0. All right, now that we factored it, look, we're just doing this. We're using the zero product property. You have the factors and it equals 0. So here we have factors and it equals 0. So we're, I'm going to go ahead and draw a line here to help me separate this so I don't forget that I'm trying to find the factors of both. This 5x equals 0, and x minus 2 equals 0. And then divide both sides by 5, you get x equals 0. Here divide, or not divide, add. Add 2 to both sides, x equals 2. So my answer is x equals 0, comma, 2. Those are my two answers for x. All right, here, look at this one. You cannot factor this until it equals 0. Why? because we want to use the zero product property. We can't use the zero product property unless it equals zero. So here's my recommendation. Let's just get this over here. I like whatever the, the biggest variable. Oh, this is an error. That's supposed to be, I'll fix this in your notes. It'll be fixed in your notes. I'll make both of these an N. So in your notes, that says an N right there, sorry. Okay, so add 25, add 25 N. So now I have six N squared plus 25n equals 0. Okay, let's go ahead and divide stuff out. So what can we divide from this? Divide, divide. Uh, does 6 go into both? No. 3, no. 25 is the problem here. So there's no number that uh, can go into 6 and 25, but I can divide an n out. See how there's both an n in both of those? So I'll put an n on the outside of my parentheses, and I'm left with 6n plus 25 equals zero. All right, and now I'll split them up. And I get for my answer here, n equals zero. Nothing to do there. That one equals zero. Or 6n plus 25 equals zero. And then if you subtract 25 and divide by 6, I'm doing this all in one step, you'd end up with a negative 25 over 6. And you can just leave the answer just like that. So my two answers would be n equals 0, comma, negative 25, 6. No need to put this into a decimal. Just leave it as a fraction. It's so much easier to just leave it like that. Okay, so I want you to try this very last one on your own. So pause the video now. Try this one. It's very similar to the last one I just did. And see if you, you can get the answer that I'll have appear here in just a minute. Okay, there's the answers. You should have come up with a zero and a one half. Uh, you can see my work here if you need to pause that and try to see how I did that when you can. All right, that is the end of this lesson. So rock that mastery check. Be really good at this greatest common factors because it will be in every lesson for this unit. All right, see you in the next lesson.